Jonathan Empett is Director of Research at the Orpheus Institute and Associate Professor at Middlesex University London. Jonathan's professional and research activities cover many aspects of contemporary music practice as trumpet player, composer and theorist. He leads the research cluster Music, Thought and Technology at the Orpheus Institute. His research is concerned with the discourses and practices of contemporary musical creativity, particularly the nature of the contemporary technologically situated musical artefact. In the field of historical performance, he is a long-standing member of both the Orchestra of the 18th Century and the Amsterdam Baroque Orchestra. He is also a member of the Exper Experimental Chamber Ensemble Apartment House. As a soloist, he has given premieres of works by composers including Skelsey, Berio, Harvey and Finnessy. He directed the live electronic chamber ensemble Metanoia and was awarded a pre Ars Electronica for his development of the Meta Trumpet. His compositions have been broadcast throughout Europe. As an improviser, he has played with musicians as diverse as Paul Dunmill and Amos Chaduri. Work in the space between composition and improvisation has led to continuous research in the areas of interactive systems and interfaces. The current Active Sound Space project uses a life populations of wave models to create interactive works combining aspects of composition and sound art. A monograph on the music of Luigi Nono has recently been published by Routledge and Jonathan is currently working on a project considering the nature of the contemporary musical object, the work without content. And we're delighted to have Jonathan with us today to, pre to present this guest lecture entitled Thinking Music Through Technology. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Denise. Uh, that many words makes one feel very old, I must say. Uh, <clears throat> either that or, or, uh, or too busy. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's me, pretty much. Uh, I've always been fascinated with uh, how music is made, with why it's made. And for a while, um, working, as, working as a freelance musician, uh, I felt a certain um, schizophrenia in terms of the kinds of things I was doing, the different kinds of things I was doing. Um, and uh, having given this some thought, I reconciled myself to the notion that actually this is normal. This is normal musical behavior for our time. That actually finding a way of dealing with this range of contemporary music practices uh, is a, a central issue for all of us. That's what we as musicians do. We situate ourselves in multiple networks of musical practices of kinds of knowledge of kinds of cultural context and this uh, self-identification this uh, sort of dynamic identity we have to generate for ourselves is one of the aspects of uh, what here is known as um, artistic research i'll just talk about that for a moment because it, it can be a little mystifying from the outside to understand uh, what the orpheus institute does and how it works so my plan is to talk for a moment about that. Then I'll talk about a, a slightly theoretical project we've been working on, and then a very practical one. So Orpheus. Orpheus uh, has existed for 24, 25 years now. It was set up really to, uh, the brief was to actually fill the gap, as it were, between conservatories and universities, which in most uh, continental European structures had very separate approaches to music, musicology and analysis on one hand, and uh, preparation for the performance pro profession on the other. So this was, uh, shall we say, an uncharacteristically visionary idea of a minister. It's not the sort of behavior we expect um, to see that there was actually an opportunity here to uh, to address a need with all sorts of cultural changes uh, that have been going on uh, i'm director of research here the last thing i do is direct research i always say that my job uh, is to prevent any kind of dogma or formula emerging for what artistic research uh, 
might be. And of course, it's got all sorts of cognate relations in, in different, um, what I think of as different knowledge economies. In the UK, uh, people are just undergoing the, the, the research excellence framework at the moment, causing people uh, nightmares and their research led practice or practice led research or, you know, any any combination you want to put in your lottery ticket uh, has value of different kinds. The point is that there's a more general movement here. We think of it as research that can only be carried out by an artist. There are questions uh, that only an artist can address through their work as an artist. So it's not musicology. It's not, uh, shall we say, uh, composition development. It's not improving your technique. Uh, it's really trying to generate knowledge uh, that can only be generated by artists through their art. But in order that it's more than just doing your thing for yourself, then there's an element of sharing this knowledge that I think is uh, inherent in the notion of artistic research as we carry it out here. The knowledge produced has to be shared in some way and how we think about sharing it, communicating it, uh, with whom, why and in what form becomes uh, an integral component of the research of the research itself. Now, of course, there's a there's a potential contradiction here. That is, we're talking about knowledge that is generated through the artistry, through the work of an artist, through their experimental work, through the questions they pose themselves, and we're talking about sharing it. So there's a, there's a sort of double think involved in this process, clearly. It's inherently transdisciplinary, I'd say. We're looking for, we're importing ideas the whole time. Uh, and I'll come on when I talk about the, the next topic to the notion of, of metaphor, but largely that's what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about conceptual models, uh, often imported from, from other areas of knowledge. And we see that in music in general. You know, a lot of the major advances in music over the last, what should we say, two or three generations, uh, have been generated by, uh, by the exploration of models that have their inception really in visual arts, in philosophy, in other disciplines, by and large not by pursuing uh, questions that had already been voiced in the making of music itself. So we're seeing methodologies being imported from ethnography, from anthropology, from all sorts of different areas. The context for this move uh, is really a change in the landscape of knowledge. The way knowledge has been understood has evolved dramatically over the last, what should we say, half century, something like that. So we see a lot of reference to things like embodied knowledge, to the knowledge of craft, to situated knowledge, to cultural knowledge. And the objectivity of scientific knowledge itself uh, is understood to require more context. So the days of um, the famous Two Cultures essay, for example, uh, have really come to an end in that respect. These things are always the kinds of knowledge we're dealing with always require contextualizing. They always require qualifying, they have a conditional sense to them. And there's some very good work recently on, on the nature of scientific knowledge, for example, how this has evolved. Uh, there are all sorts of practical examples in the real world, the world we deal with every day, that already call these into question. Things like uh, simulation, the role of simulation in our world, weather forecasting, uh, the training of pilots, is all based on uh, simulating things or largely based on simulating things uh, if you talk about things like climate change or, or uh, air disasters things that you hope will not happen so simulation has become a major part of our uh, of our knowledge map our knowledge uh, environment our knowledge context um, and we're dealing with unprovable knowledge in that respect the new artificial intelligence deals with modes of generating knowledge that are very difficult to uh, to decompose, to analyze, to prove or disprove. Black box AI uh, has returned with uh, things like machine learning, deep knowledge, uh, large data sets being analyzed in ways that we have no control over. 
Uh, and these are immensely useful, powerful tools, of course, but they transform what we understand to be uh, objective and in inverted commas knowledge. And educational institutions begin to challenge these, to acknowledge these changes, which is not a straightforward thing to do, as we see with the whole business of uh, formulating what any kind of artistic doctorate might be, how you examine such a thing, how you uh, evaluate the extent to which the knowledge that's produced is useful, can be shared, uh, is communicable, while at the same time uh, insisting that the knowledge somehow needs to be inherent in the work itself. So it's not a straightforward situation. We had a, um, a collaboration with CERN just outside Geneva a couple of years ago, which is really interesting. And you might think of this as the peak of objective, difficult science. Uh, and in fact, we found, of course, it was fascinating, and this, all this is true, but we found that actually the people with whom we had most in common were a group called the phenomenologists. And the phenomenologists, um, basically, they work like composers. So on one hand, you have the uh, theoretical physicists, the people dreaming up impossible worlds that may or may not be true, or may or may not be useful, or may or may not be provable. At the other end, you have things like uh, data analysts, sensor designers, these sorts of people. And they're doing the experiments, which is very difficult. This is hard stuff that I can't begin to get a handle on. In between, somebody has to work out from these beautiful theories what on earth you can actually implement and prove and realize in a useful way. And this is kind of a creative challenge. This is like a compositional task. Coming up with beautiful aesthetic ideas uh, is frankly not difficult. I always used to tell composition students that good ideas are cheap. Coming up with those uh, is only the first stage. It's then perceiving in those what can be realized usefully in our world, in our cultural context, with our tools, uh, with the conceptual models that we have at our disposal to make sense of these things. There's no point in coming up with something that, that then can't be made sense of. So there was a lot to be learned there. Then the cultural landscape in which we produce this knowledge has changed vastly. Um, we all have multiple identities now. I think few of us, there's a beautiful book by Amin Malouf on identity. He's talking about the French political scene, but uh, the point is that all of us work with these multiple identities in different layers, in different networks uh, that we inhabit perhaps at different times that may even conflict in certain moments. This is true of uh, cultural infrastructure as well. It's true of educational establishments. So, for example, the challenge of prioritizing European art music uh, at a university is, is non-trivial. Why, why should that be at the center of any kind of music education, for example? The other side of that, uh, which I'm sure we all experienced, is the need for uh, mobility within the professional landscape. That is, becoming a musician is now, uh, well, it's a way a more complicated thing, or perhaps we have to be more honest. That is, the idea of getting an off-the-shelf job as a musician, which perhaps some, I don't know, a conservatory, perhaps some generations ago, might have taken as their standard model for why and how you learn the trade of music, uh, is simply not tenable. I mean, how many people are actually going to walk into a job in an orchestra, an opera house, or whatever? That, that's not the norm. It can happen. Um, but for most of us, the norm is actually dodging and weaving, creating our own opportunities, uh, identifying uh, opportunities, of identifying affordances within the cultural and the musical landscape uh, that we can connect with, around which we can create something, identifying resonances between different aspects of our practice, our multiple practices, and what's going on in the world. So we have to be engaging in what you might call uh, an artistic research mentality frame of mind the whole time. That's really one of our professional skills. So uh, this is a long winded way of saying that the, the context for what uh, we might highfalutingly call artistic research uh, is now very rich. It's now a very crucial part of our equipment as musicians. And uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, we all need to engage with it in, in one way or another.
And I would suggest, in fact, that the most successful artists, the people we look to from the past, have always done this. Now, I'm going to share my screen with you for a moment and talk about um, one of the research clusters. We have six research clusters here at Orpheus working in different areas. And the one I lead is called Music, Thought and Technology, um, which I should be able to find somewhere. There we are. Music, Thought and Technology. Uh, the clues in the name pretty much but this is uh, a nexus around which well for example a lot of PhDs that I get to examine they circle around these areas at one moment they're talking about creative musicianship at another they're talking about inventing some new gizmo or technique uh, or exploring some possibility at another moment they're talking about cognition on one hand or philosophy on the other hand and it's always a game of, of catch, right? As soon as you think you know what the PhD is about, actually it's about the other thing. So trying to bring some focus to this area, uh, uh, rather than pretend that these are separable, entirely separable areas, uh, was, um, was one of the thoughts behind setting up this group. Uh, there, that sets out what we try to do to investigate the ways in which an informational environment conditions the ways we think about, engage with and practice music, and the ways in which we might reconceive our terms and methods for doing so, uh, such that they're appropriate to our informational environment. What do I mean by our informational environment? Well, that's the world we live in, right? It's a data world, it's an informational world. And what I'm gonna try and say over the next few minutes is that this isn't just a matter of dealing with information, with dealing with data, uh, when you're dealing with it by means of computers, but actually these uh, govern the conceptual models with which we uh, we naturally engage with the contemporary world. And I'm going to suggest that we do so not only when we're uh, dealing with with kinds of thoughts that we might identify explicitly with technology and if we're going to do this that means reconceiving how we understand music how we imagine music the terms the modes the models uh, we use to deal with music to create it to engage with it to understand it to uh, to deal with it critically or to discuss it between ourselves to to, to to generate any kind of discourse around it and as I said at the beginning, what we're talking about here is not just what sounds like contemporary music, what looks like contemporary music, and certainly not just what looks like technological music. I'm talking about all of the practices that, uh, that we engage with in, in our world. There's a list of the people um, that, uh, that participate in this group. Some of them you might know. There's a neighbor of yours from Trinity, my dear friend Nick, uh, and Simon just up the road at Sark. Um, and you may recognize some of the other names. There's some very practical uh, questions at work here because we're very practical people. We're all music makers. Uh, how do we make musical objects in performance? Uh, and in particular, what are the temporal structures, the temporal boundaries of doing that? How do we think of real time? What's the difference between composition and improvisation? These sorts of questions. What are appropriate constructive concepts? How do we go about making stuff? I mean, one way is to just take the tools you're given and say, well, what can I do with this? And that's a perfectly valid experimental process, but I think we can think a little more deeply than that. And one, a question that often uh, escapes scrutiny because it's kind of intractable, is that in a world where people are increasingly developing their own practices, their own unique practices, their own interfaces, their own software, their own style, language. Uh, how do we get these people to work together? We can put a bit more flesh on these questions. What are the materials we're working with? How do we deal with the incommensurability of these materials? So say, I'm going to introduce uh, shortly uh, a case of uh, improvisation with live electronics. Um, how do we deal with the different modes of representation? We have audio streams, we have the gestures, you can see people making physicality. We have all sorts of data that we derive from the interfaces. Um, 
we have symbolic representation of the music as it's happening. And these all live, live in entirely different worlds. You can't just, well, you can just map one onto another, but uh, that's not a very reflective thing to do. And what is the present? What is the present? We know, you know, as soon as you start working with computers in supposed real time, that there's no such thing. Um, it's the spurious present, as James called it 100 years ago, right? Uh, you're talking about retention and protension, as Husserl called it, getting on for 100 years ago. Um, you're constantly working within this expandable, contractible window around what feels to you like the present moment. The difference working with computers is that this present moment might expand back to something that was recorded or you have data about for some reason, goodness knows how long ago, and you can make something happen at any time you like in the future, as long as you're set up right. So why should you or shouldn't you do any of these things? What are the confines of this space and how do we create form then? What are the bounds of this? We're making some kind of musical phenomenon. When does it stop and start? Why should it stop and start when we walk on and off the stage? Uh, what are appropriate constructive concepts? Well, as I said, you can just use the tools as you get them from the shop, as it were, if you're just talking about music technology. Um, but then you're working with basically an effects box. I just talk, talked about using uh, data uh, from any mode of representation you like and mapping it onto anything else. Well, you can actually do that. But that's, I call it universal transduction. You're taking a form of energy from one aspect of, uh, let's call it the material world, the physical world, you're abstracting it into data and you're simply mapping it onto another, which can be sound production, it can be lights, it can be whatever you like. Now, if you want to take um, stock exchange records from Lima from a decade ago and project them onto the way lights are going to change in Sydney in 10 years time, you can do it as long as you set up right. But why on earth should you do that? How do you create any kind of sense out of this kind of um, association of those different uh, forms of data you have access to? And how do you endow or ascribe agency? At what point do these things become autonomous? Do they feel as if they're doing something or do they afford some kind of uh, response to you? And thirdly, the question I mentioned before, how do artists work together when each creates their own unique performance environment? And here, um, and there I put up two, uh, two conventional ways of approaching that, neither of which really address the question. Um, and questions of commonality will emerge, emerge from what I'm about to talk about. I talked about three fundamental concepts, intuitive technologies, maps of inscription, and the work without content or uh, music as a dynamic system. Maps of inscription is our concept for dealing with uh, the difficulty that musical discourse currently has in dealing with, say, the difference between improvised music and composed music, dealing with vernacular musics and pff, what do you want to call them? Composed musics. Uh, dealing with stuff that happens in a machine, the difference between stuff that happens in a machine on one hand and very performative things on the other. Now, if you're looking at their most superficial level of representation, a score or an audio file or whatever, this becomes very tricky. But if you're very specific about what phenomenon you're talking about, you can look at how uh, this may have been formed, constituted, by factors that are distributed through time and through some of these different areas that are that are listed here. There's a beautiful book by Edwin Hutchins called Cognition in the Wild. He was a psychologist working with the US Navy for a while. And uh, the first scene of this book is they're on a US Navy carrier coming into San Diego Harbor. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these carriers. I saw one in Haifa once, but sheer coincidence. I was playing the Christmas Oratorio in Haifa already. That's pretty weird. But anyway, we looked down and there was the sixth fleet in port. This carrier was basically the length of the horizon. So this thing's coming into port in San Diego and it loses all power. Nobody has any control over anything. 
no electricity, no backup, no steering, no nothing. How do you solve it? There's no one person, there's no one control system that, that can prevent this thing basically just crashing into the harbour. So he describes the ways in which, it's an exercise of course, he describes the ways in which this is resolved and the ways in which this enormously important common aggregate action is distributed through people, through social structures, ranks, people knowing their place, knowing uh, practice within the Navy, through bits of technology, everything from very high powered computers to uh, compasses and protractors, um, to uh, data storage devices, again, everything from computers to charts, pieces of paper, uh, through the technologies that operate the machine itself, through different sub-technologies that operate the electrical system, through people uh, using uh, physical signals to uh, communicate from one end of the flight deck to other. It's a fascinating read. Anyway, the point is that important uh, human activities are by their nature distributed through all these things and distributed them through them in time. So one way we might characterize a very particular musical phenomenon, say, I don't know, a solo set by Evan Parker on one hand, or the score of a Beethoven string quartet on the other, is we might look at the factors, the distribution of decision-making and re-inscription of mediation that leads to the production of this particular phenomenon. It does mean we have to be very particular, uh, specific about the phenomenon, but um, this would give us a way of uniquely characterizing each of these phenomena and allowing us to, to talk about them together. And it's how we talk about things, how, about how we talk about different kinds of musical activity uh, together that uh, led us to look at what we call intuitive technology. So the notion of intuitive technology suggests that our engagement with music uh, happens on the basis of, we call it a second order intuitive technology. There's a whole list of, there's a whole bunch of theory about what an intuitive theory is, uh, which we could go into, but that's another, that's another discussion. But the point is, it's a bunch of ideas derived from technology in the broadest sense and through mediated experience. So what might this technology mean? Well, we're not talking just about computers. We're not talking about just about machines. Uh, we're talking about human ways of doing stuff in the world, of operating on materials of any kind. Human ways of explaining or understanding or rationalizing what happens in the world. So uh, astronomy is, an astro is, is a technology from this perspective, and of course it's dependent on technologies. So modern astronomy is heavily dependent on modern technologies. But what about um, pre-telescope astronomy, for example? What about the astrolabe? Well, yeah, that's absolutely a technology. That's a thing. So what about uh, astrology from that point of view? Pretty soon, the, uh, the distinction between technologies, once you start thinking of them like this, and uh, ways of rationalizing, which frankly merge into belief systems, uh, become very, very vague. My favorite limit case is uh, saints, right? Um, it's sheer coincidence that I'm saying this to a talk in Ireland. So if you, uh, if you uh, are convinced utterly doesn't talk about belief you're convinced for some reason for some set of reasons because somebody in authority has told you this and because you've been pointed to certain historical instances and things may have happened within your hearsay that justify it so uh, i don't know much about saints in padova in italy if you've lost something you pray to san antonio right or if you want a boyfriend actually same one i don't know why they're united but there you go uh, i was talking about multiple skills so in that respect, you might consider it a technology. That's my favorite limit case. Whereas clearly your computer and its associated software and everything like that is a technology. So it's a long, it's a long list of things. 
but it's basically your ways of rationalizing what happens in the world and that you can't rationalize what happens in the world and that includes engagement with music without some kind of repertoire of concepts and models that allows you to deal with what you're being confronted with that allows you to understand it in some way this gives you terms it gives you models it gives you processes and references why are we interested in looking at this because of the fragmentation of musical discourse which i've just been talking about so we have this highly diffuse diverse set of musical practices that we all engage in of music that we all um, participate in engage with um, but it's very difficult to speak of them um, in the same discussion and there's another um, there's another fracture there there's a very important article by Georgina Bourne I think 2010 um, and she points to the uh, the difficulty that very sophisticated views of music that are socially uh, founded have in dealing with very sophisticated views of music that are founded in the material itself it's very difficult uh, for either of them to cross that boundary so what we're proposing here is uh, a way of understanding how we constitute musical concepts the concepts by which we create music by which we understand music both consciously and informally that is when we just someone listening to music that would allow us to deal with that and there's another set of questions that what we want to do is, is propose is, is closely related uh, which is a set of questions around the uh, the relationship between culture and technology now obviously this is a very uh, current discussion because technology is so in our face now and this is why it's a, 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 a crucial moment for thinking about things this way we talk about intuitive technologies um, and we have a new journal called echo an online journal the first few issues of which are really looking at what we think of as techno tropes that are just in the world so we talk about um, we talk about networks we talk about uh, we, we use the notion of the the digital archive let's call it that data uh, we talk about feedback we understand interfaces we understand what simulation is these are things these are uh, metaphorical devices metaphorical operations let's call them that that we use in everyday speech in vernacular conversation they're not just techno uh, terms uh, nor do we have to be we don't have to pretend expertise in them in order to use them usefully and what we want to propose with this idea is that that's actually crucial it's not that we're ignorant and that we're using them lazily it's that these kind of frankly second-hand ideas have always been uh, important in cultural apprehension in cultural production um, this is uh, from the late Bernard Stiegler's uh, the first of his books on techniques uh, and time uh, two important points here that modern techniques let's just call it technology nevertheless remains a mode of disclosure a mode of knowledge and constitutes what is most properly to be thought right it gives us the mechanisms for thought in contemporary culture but at the same time he points to uh, he calls it a divorce between culture and techniques and here he points to a temporal problem between the different speeds of development of culture and technology and this is what we want to suggest uh, by using this notion of intuitive technology is actually uh, solvable or addressable that is even Bernard Stiegler is not quite using the right terms and repeatedly what we find is that uh, what seem to be difficult questions at any given moment are often difficult precisely because the terms of the questions are not quite right and that actually the terms of the answers already exist so it's a question once new possibilities come into the world new ways of thinking come into the world new technologies if you like come into the world uh, what actually takes longer is for us to adapt the models of thought we use in order to see what they might do to really take advantage and to, to progress with these things <clears throat> 
that this I was very a very uh, you yeah, know relieved frankly to find this uh, recently. So the whole question of technology, of course, uh, and its relationship with society. There's a lot of writing from from the time of the Industrial Revolution, needless to say. But uh, that Marx made this point, uh, the, the lower paragraph here, that technology reveals the active relation of man to nature, the direct process of the production of his life, and it thereby also lays bare the process of the production of the social relations of his life and of the mental conceptions that flow from these relations. This is a footnote somewhere in Capital, but a very perceptive one, I think. So time becomes the issue. And there are all sorts of views of how technological time works. Uh, there's a historian of economics, really, uh, Carlota Perez. She talks about long temporal waves uh, that, you know, things get invented and they get developed and they get accepted and they get assimilated and then something else comes along and that we're just in a certain moment of that wave. The other extreme is someone like Biffo Berardi, who says, no, we're living in the time of what he calls the slow cancellation of the future, which is really, uh, it, it's a, a state of emergency for him. Uh, or uh, Humbert Rosa calls this a moment of stasis. And what they both say is that, no, we're now at a stage where the speed of technology is so, the acceleration of technology is so great, and the amount of data the stimulus we're faced with constantly, that we have to react with constantly, is so great that actually uh, we can't move. That paradoxically, the cult of individualism, of us each having to deal with this individually, leaves no space for the formation of the individual, uh, which, if you're an artist, is kind of problematic. So, how do we address that? Well, thankfully, there are uh, there are answers to this. So we might look at Berardi himself. He looks to the self-organization of collective knowledge. Uh, Antonio Negri, uh, and before you point it out, you might say, yeah, but this is a bunch of Marxists responding to the, day, uh, the chaos of 2008 and the years immediately following that. Well, that's kind of true. He talks about the recognition of the common in contemporary artistic production. We go back to Agamben, who's absolutely not of this bent, a decade earlier. And he talks about, it's a beautiful book called The Man Without Content. And he's addressing the death of art. And he says, well, no, art has gone through a phase, shall we say, a cycle. And what we've come back to is, if, is in a way, a point zero. And what we have to do is acknowledge this point zero, that uh, what we have in common is not a bunch of styles and languages and preferences and genres and practices. It's emptiness. And what art does, what the art instinct is about, is filling that emptiness. And it's the commonality of that process that we should look to and uh, that actually shows us the way forward. He calls it a, a poetic, poetic moment that we recognize that humanity is our common humanity is in the process of creation in response to this degree zero of um, of art, the common emptiness, and that recognizing this is actually the most important lesson of of our of our current moment. And then Badiou, Alain Badiou, he takes that up. He says the present ignorance has to be seen as the space of a possibility. We have to start from the ignorance of the general intellect. The force of the collective intelligence is boundless. And I haven't got time to look at them now, but I recommend you look at Badiou's axioms for an affirmative aesthetics. If you're ever short of inspiration, if you're ever thinking, how uh, can I refine my faith in myself as an artist or in art in general, look for his axioms for an affirmative aesthetics. I might see if I can find them when we're talking afterwards, but they're quite beautiful. And they are grounded in commonality, in acknowledging uh, the non-existence of uh, any common positive ground, of our common ignorance, as Badiou calls it. Okay, so what we're suggesting here 
is that among all of these different languages that they were dealing with, this, this, this plurality of musical uh, practices, that uh, we have this common informal repertory of operators that we see as predictive or sense-making. That there is a technicity in music that is inherent to music. That is, if you're going to engage with music beyond, uh, I think of it as the hook and the groove, right? So you've got echoic memory, that'll give you a few notes, or you can, you can uh, what is it, seven plus or minus two or something, you know, how many things you can bear in mind at the same time. And you've got a sort of muscle memory that within human ballistics, you can kind of replicate. So that gives you a hook, it gives you a groove. As soon as you construct anything that's more complicated than that, you've got to make technical decisions. And in listening to music, you apprehend these technical decisions. Um, there are all sorts of accounts of, of, of other disciplines, other areas of thought in this respect. Thought itself, uh, Andy Clark's books, uh, of course, you know, then, then in fact, the computer becomes the model for the brain, although uh, the notion of mind goes way beyond that, of course of language. Uh, Jack du Goody, a wonderful anthropologist, already in the 70s, he called language the technology of the intellect, of writing, the business of writing in many ways. It's often been studied as a technology, mathematics, science itself, Gilbert Chatelet, uh, his wonderful uh, books uh, from the 90s on the, uh, on the technologies of science. Metaphor itself, Chatelet proposes, is a technology. Um, and uh, art. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, Alva Noe's book, Strange Tools, from a few years ago. Wonderful book, I think. Uh, in a way, its strength is its innocence. That is, his prime work is not as an artist, but he has a strong aesthetic sense. Uh, and he talks about this. Art is not a technological practice any more than choreography is a way of dancing. But art presupposes technology and can be understood only against that background. And technologies are natural for us. That comes back to that's Marx, right? That's the quote we looked at earlier. So you could uh, look at music in all sorts of ways from this perspective. You could uh, imagine a history of music. You could imagine, uh, look at how uh, composition changed with the Ars Nova, with the introduction of menstrual notation, of thinking of rhythm in terms of ticks rather than just what is shorter, what is longer and neater, right? It's no accident that that was dreamed up uh, in the same cities in the same decade as a clock that moves in ticks, the escapement action. Uh, you could think of Rameau's uh, theory of harmony and the standardization of the new world of natural sciences around that time look at the effect on, of paper production through the 18th century. By Bach, we have basically no sketches. Beethoven could use uh, paper the way we use an external hard drive, jot something down in case it might come handy one day. Why? Because paper, white paper, became much cheaper through the 18th century, massive uh, influence. Uh, look at the influence of uh, seeing the Industrial Revolution in England on Haydn, how it changes his thinking, the thing, thoughts he brings back to Vienna. Look at uh, um, the notion of phonographic listening on Mahler. Mahler, uh, an antenna, right, saying he couldn't, he could only write parody, he couldn't compose, he could only parody what he was hearing. He became a phonographic composer. Of course, we don't have recordings by him, but he lived in a world where recording was becoming uh, the norm or in the same city at the same time, the influence of uh, symbolic logic of Frege, people like that on, on Schoenberg and so on and so on and so on. Um, you could think, you could write a whole history of music from that point of view, rather than from the point of view of great composers and masterworks. Um, and uh, double hermeneutics, we don't have time to deal with here, except that it's an important concept because it uh, it was, it's an Anthony Giddens concept from sociology. The notion that terms have a double life, that is, for example, technological terms have a technological origin, they become used in vernacular conversation, and they go back to technologists who then work with them, using them in that vernacular way. 
and they get recycled and so on and so on. There's a sort of cyclic feedback thing going on there. And the notion that music, um, that music is a long cultural experience of virtuality. So as we're learning to deal with the digital world, with what digital objects are, with what our relationship with virtual, uh, with, um, with virtual things might be, with how we reconceive materiality in a future hybrid world. I would say that music uh, is a long cultural experience that has a lot to tell us about exactly that situation. And that if we reconceive music from that perspective, music in turn will tell us a lot about how to, uh, how to deal with, with the coming world. That's pretty much uh, what I had to say about the Intuitive Technologies project. Um, I was going to show you some of our practical outcomes, but I think we're a bit short of time. So I'll defer to Denise's decision making here. Well, we still have um, 10 minutes or so for some questions and discussion. So if there's something else that you would like to say before you finish up, I think we have a few minutes for that. Well, OK, we've got a, a one of the practical projects we're dealing with at the moment is called Three States of Wax. Um, and uh, the initial performers, as you can see, are a trumpet player and a guitarist. Uh, those are recent pictures of us. We uh, are dealing with music as a complex dynamical system, which I won't explain now, except that it's an important approach to what a musical object might be in that it's reconstituted every time. It has certain properties of its that you might regard as autonomous, as internal to it, but it's reconstituting itself constantly in a situation, in interaction with the world. And different systems have different amounts of interaction with the world over different time scales. Uh, we get the notion of three states of wax from an early work by Michel Serre, who's a wonderful uh, philosopher of science. But through his work, the, the main metaphors are from the sea, because he began as a sailor, and from music. And there's an excellent book on music by him, one of the last books he wrote, he died, I think, 2010, uh, is an excellent book, uh, which is very perceptive, a very perceptive a way of explaining music. Michel Serre, I re really recommend that to you very highly. He talks about what are the objects, he asks himself, what are the objects of study in science, in physics particularly, actual objects, material objects. He goes back to Descartes' thought experiment of a piece of wax, which can constantly be changing into something else. You can smell it, but if you burn it, you lose some of its properties and so on. So what on earth is it? Descartes says, well, it's just in your head, really. Um, Serre says, well, no, not really. You can think of this ultimately for our world. Any object is a nexus of information. It carries information about its origins, about its production, about how it might be used, about its properties. And crucially, every interaction with this thing adds to its information. There's no such thing as a sort of innocent interrogation of it. You have anything to do with it. You want to know anything about it. You're adding to its history. And you can think of this from many perspectives. That's the way a lot of um, well, databases work in the digital humanities, that you're constantly adding knowledge maps to some kind of basic resource. Well, this is how we think of information uh, of objects within our new uh, Three States of Wax project. Uh, Luciano Floridi, I recommend to you also. Uh, the design of uh, information the third book of his trilogy on information logic, designing philosophy in the age of information. So we're using his design approach. He says you have to design, uh, he's talking about philosophy, but philosophy in his case becomes a placeholder for anything. The philosophy, if, if you like, becomes a human, a human activity in, in its most abstract form. And music's, you know, it's pretty abstract, so we're really not far away. He takes design principles into that. And he says creation comes back to artistic research, in essence. Creation is part of knowledge production. It's part of how you design knowledge production in an informational age. You don't do it by uh, mimesis, by, by imitating something and then analyzing it. You do it by creating something new. Um, so I'll just play you. 
the beginning of a three states of wax performance. Um, I'm going to play you the opening because it's just where we set up some material. I'm going to play the middle because you hear the history of this information coming back and the end because you hear form in form. Okay, so very basic, very basic uh, seeds for this thing, but it then develops its own behavior on the basis of the information and the history of this information. Okay, so you can hear all sorts of stuff going on there, and it generates its own formal decisions. Let's find something towards the end where you might hear that happening. Okay, that's enough of that. So there you are. The, the whole thing, it, it makes formal decisions on the basis of its own behavior. That's the end of my example. <laughs>